Welcome to the Carter Center's Forum on Women, Religion, Violence, and Power Roundtable Series. Today is our first in a series of roundtables on women peacemakers, and we are really delighted to have two very strong and uh, expert guests with us to talk about um, how are we dealing with current events in the world, what should we be doing, how should we be thinking about current events related to the escalation of violent extremism here in the U.S. and abroad. Um, our two guests to, that I'm going to bring in in a, in a couple of minutes are Rabia Chaudhry um, and Irfana Anwar. Rabia Chaudhry is an attorney uh, and international security fellow at the New America Foundation where she heads a Countering Violent Extremism, or CVE is the acronym, and Community Engagement Project focused on social media recruitment by violent extremists and law enforcement community engagement. Um, by violent extremists, and, law, and she works with law enforcement and community engagement programs. She's also the president and founder of the Safe Nation Collaborative, a law enforcement training program. She's going to have a lot to tell us about what's happening in the U.S. and what the U.S. government hopes to achieve with its uh, CVE programs. Uh, Irfana Anwar is with the Institute for Inclusive Security and is the Pakistan team leader there where she manages efforts to increase the visibility of women's leadership in promoting peace and social cohesion in Pakistan. Um, so I'm going to bring uh, the both of them in in a second and I just want to talk uh, briefly about the Carter Center's interest in this work. Former President Jimmy Carter has been working and talking about the issue of human rights in the context of the global war on terror for now uh, 12 years. In 2003 the Carter Center hosted uh, uh, a human rights defenders forum with human rights activists from 43 countries where we really looked at the worry that the, the global war on terror and the invasion of Iraq in particular would lead to a backlash against human rights activists would lead to the erosion of human rights globally so this was a worry that we had uh, 12 years ago and we really see that bearing out um, with regression and human rights protections all over the world, including in the Middle East, but also in the U.S. with uh, mass surveillance, with um, torture issues around the commission of torture by our agents and a lack of accountability for torture, uh, in fact, impunity for torture. So we see this problem globally in erosion of human rights. And we are worried, we've been worried, that the war frame, framing the idea that you can actually uh, attack the idea of terror or undermine violent extremists by creating sort of a banner of warfare, that war itself is the right frame for dealing with terrorism. Often, you know, what many international law experts say is that when you create a banner around war, this is a banner under which people like bin Laden and others, al-Baghdadi now with ISIS, can recruit under this banner of warfare. So are we undermining ourselves in dealing with violent extremism by creating a framework that uses war and military mi militarism, military approaches, is that in fact making it worse? So these are some questions we're going to be asking, but there are events here in the US that have American citizens quite concerned. Uh, there was the, 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 the shooting in Chattanooga that was quite horrific. 16, six Marines were killed at a Marine recruiting center uh, by a, a, a shooter who, uh, according to the, the reports, had some sympathies with, uh, with ISIS or extremists, uh, Islamic extremists. This is quite concerning to the American public. Um, we also had, just in Georgia yesterday, uh, a 37-year-old man was convicted of trying to join ISIS and sentenced to 15 years in prison right here in the state of Georgia. Um, I also want to point out that the Carter Center is interested in undermining extremism or dealing with extremism in the best way possible in all communities. We know that the shooter in Charleston, South Carolina was part of a white supremacist movement. Um, which is a link to Christian beliefs of whites or, or claims of, of Christians' uh, biblical support for white extremism, white, su white supremacy, um, and that the shooter was motivated apparently by these beliefs. Uh, we've also, uh, we will be hosting roundtable series about this and uh, Buddhist extremism in Myanmar and other places where we really see the rise of extremism in many faith contexts, that religion itself is serving as a sort of fuel uh, by 
certain leaders who are either power hungry, have a misunderstanding of their religion, um, use it at, and instrumentalize religion as a way to recruit violent supporters. Uh, we know this is on the upswing everywhere. So this is of concern to us. Um, we want to address it and so we are really grateful to have our our two guests today to, to, to help us understand what's going on and what we should do about it. So I'm going to start with Rabia Chaudhry, who I also should mention, obviously, and I'm going to uh, resist the temptation to ask Rabia about the latest development in the Adnan Syed case. <laughs> she, uh, Rabia is obviously the um, one of the key characters in the, the very popular serial podcast and has her own podcast called Undisclosed, uh, which is a, a, um, a really deep dive into the, the law and the, the case itself and, and the, the, the court case against Adnan Syed. So check that out. Uh, we, will talk about, um, we will talk about it a little bit later in the program, um, how the potential linkages between these two things, uh, potential anti-Muslim bias in, um, in, uh, um, in, how the courts and how law enforcement um, approach these cases um, with, with Rabia later in the program. Um, but I'd like to tr ask Rabia first, can you talk to us about what CVE means? What is CVE? Um, it stands for Countering Violent Extremism, okay, but without getting too far into the weeds of the field, what are professionals like you doing um, and what does the U.S. government think it can accomplish? Uh, well, first of all, let me just say thank you, Karen, and to the Carter Center for organizing this and for having this discussion and for having um, uh, for inviting me to it. I'll talk a little bit about CVE. CVE is a framework that the U.S. government adopted a few years ago in response to commute. I would say in response to community concerns, but also law enforcement concerns about how to deal with um, the issue of recruitment and. I want to say in quotes radicalization, um, and you know, and the response, uh, the framework generally, very broadly speaking, and, and believe me, it is a very vague term. It's a vague term whether you're talking domestically or internationally. CVE programming can look like lots of different things. It can look like community resilience. It can look like development. It can look like youth engagement and women's empowerment. Um, but generally, the idea of CVE, the, the basic idea is that you engage communities, you partner with communities, you give them some responsibility on this. And in theory, it sounds like a better approach than the, pre, you know, the, 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 the era before CVE, which was uh, heavily law enforcement uh, focused and, um, you know, prosecution focused approach, uh, but it has not quite panned out the way I think either government or communities wanted it to. Uh, and it's been, a, there have been a lot of challenges in the last three, four years, and I would say by and large, at least domestically, it has, um, it really has failed to gain, gain any traction. So, what, tell me what it is that you do. How do you work with law enforcement um, and within the community? What are the kinds of programs? And what do you, uh, okay, so, so I've heard, you know, we've heard stories of, you know, federal entrapment, FBI entrapment of, uh, you know, there are some cases, but these could be just the exception, I don't know. What um, we, one of our friends, our mutual friends, Mubin Sheikh, is, is a person who goes into the community and tries to work with young people to, to, to really help them understand that this uh, recruitment that's happening and, uh, by extremists is dangerous and that they should um, really understand what's going on and they should really understand the true religion. So t talk about what is the work. Um, again, the work can look like a lot of different things. Now in the United States, the work has been very, very limited, I would say. From the government side, the work has generally been round tables, talking to communities, connecting with communities, and that's it. Um, on the community end of it, there have been very limited programs. For example, uh, MPAC, which is the Muslim Public Affairs Council, has a CVE uh, a program. Uh, the New America Foundation program that I run is, although it was initially framed as a CVE program, it really turned into, because of the concerns even our tech partners had, you know, this is a program that we partner with Google, Facebook, Twitter, uh, the, the social media companies, and essentially we go and we give social media advocacy training, 
uh, to Muslim communities across the country. So to activists, advocates, faith groups, and we've done it in about nine different cities. Uh, and the idea is that you know what we found is that uh, violent ext you know, the social media has been using is being used by two groups very effectively, uh, both of which are marginalizing the normative Muslim voice. One is violent extremists who use social media very effectively to recruit um, and to, to to propagate their messaging, and the second is actually anti-Muslim bigots. So you know the Islamophobes mm -hmm. also use. Um, the same medium, and both of these groups, you know, they echo one another. And in the in the meantime, in any given community, you have dozens of amazing um, organizations and activists who are doing great work, but nobody's hearing their stories. So you keep hearing, and the, you know, the media kind of perpetuates this too. So the media is not relaying, the mainstream media is not relaying the stories of, you know, the normative, the average Muslim, whether it's in the West or where, whether it's uh, anywhere across the globe. Uh, so social media is a very powerful tool, and, and we are just trying to teach the communities to use it better. Now, we don't necessarily expect that they're going to be, and we talk to them about this. We're very uh, open about you know the the program itself, um, the inception of it, which was originally uh, designed thinking that maybe communities would get this training and think, oh, we're going to counter the messaging of violent extremists. But you know, people are not going to do that um, because it's not very relevant to the lives of the average uh, American Muslim. And so, mm -hmm. it's uh, it has been very well received. So the idea is that that, and the second part of this also is to create awareness, um, which is really lacking. A lot of people, whether they whether they are activists and leaders or whether they're just parents, they have no idea how easy it is for people to get online and engage with violent extremists or recruiters very very quickly and easily. Mm -hmm. So uh, the component of awareness is very important for people to know this is out there. These people are predatory. They're looking for your youth. They're looking for your kids, and you have to understand this. Um, and then letting the community decide how they want to respond. And as far as I'm concerned, um, you know, th the ball has to be in the court of the community. How do you want to respond to this? Do you want to respond to this at all? Is this an issue or not an issue? Um, and you, you mentioned the Chattanooga shooting and also Charleston. I mean, w one of the challenges in CVE with the Muslim community particularly is the fact that the government focused CVE has been almost actually not almost I would say exclusively on Muslim communities when we know in fact that uh, the greatest threats in terms of homegrown terrorism are actually from right-wing um, separatist neo-nazi skinhead types of groups and not Muslim violent extremists and what do they say about, when you bring this up with the government? How, what is their response to this? Because right, is the CVE program is it's it's not a it's not a State Department program. It's a federal law enforcement pro program. So there's no reason for it to be foreign focused necessarily. Um, so so what is the government reaction to the criti that criticism? Because I've seen there have been lots of interesting polls and surveys uh, and reports about this about the about the, the the threat level from these from uh, white extreme white uh, supremacist groups versus uh, Islamic extremist groups in the U.S. domestic groups. There, so yeah. so what are the what does the government say about this? Yeah, let me first clarify. There really isn't such a there isn't specifically a government program necessarily. Okay. It's a framework in which they hope that programs will be developed by community partners, by private sector partners, um, and there is some legislation right now that is not great legislation that if it passes would probably then kind of institutionalize CVE and then create programming that doesn't exist right now. Um, the response actually is a kind of silence to it. We don't, what we hear is this, what we hear is this, that we have, a, well this is kind of an interesting response and it gives you pause and that is this, that when it comes to um, the issue of a homegrown radicalization or whatever you want to call it when it comes to white supremacists and uh, neo-Nazi types of groups, we don't take a CVE approach. We take a pure law enforcement approach. We don't go into those communities. We don't give them off-ramps. We don't partner with them. We just prosecute them. Now, in a way, some would argue that you are then giving um, Muslim, uh, potential Muslim recruits a pass because you are giving Muslim, you're telling Muslim communities, okay, you know, you should try to engage, you should have some preventative programming, you should, whereas in other communities you're not doing this, you're just going in and arresting folks. Um, on one hand, yes. On the other hand, um, the really nefarious part of 
the focus on Muslim communities is that you are then making wholesale Muslim communities responsible for you know one or two criminals a year and that's an impossible task for us to to do and it's also something that we shouldn't have to be held responsible for well great I want to come back to this Rabia um, because that that comes back to this question of um, are we missing the boat here on the framework um, you know it isn't this a law enforcement problem you know and if it's a law enforcement problem we have all kinds of ways of respond, responding to law enforcement problems, especially with young people. You have uh, diversion programs, rehabilitation programs that could be done, including with white supremacist groups. I would argue that some of the best results have been with these guys, former former members who do the de-radicalization work. So if we were could create some kind of uh, common language around that, I think it could be quite, quite interesting. So I'm going to actually bring Irfana into the conversation now to talk about this, the work of Institute for Inclusive Security in Pakistan, I think there are some similar questions here. Um, Irfana, tell us about, let's hear about the women that you're working with mm -hmm. in Pakistan who are working in their context to prevent uh, terrorism. We had a roundtable recently with uh, Musarat Kadim, mm -hmm. who is doing wonderful work um, using um, Relationships with mothers and the and religious education to bring young men out of radical radicalization. Um, can you give us some examples of this kind of work? Sure. Well, first of all, also thank you very much for organizing this and inviting us. I know absolutely. Me, Musarat Kadim is a very important partner of ours, and we work very closely with her. And you know, to really understand the kind of work that women are doing at community levels, I think first it's really important to understand how women are being impacted and how communities are being impacted. So, firstly, we see that the nature of war, and you know, you talked about the war on terror. And when we think of wars, sometimes we still think about borders. We still think about military. And the nature of war and conflict is changing. We see, especially in some, a country like Pakistan, the attacks, the conflict is happening in communities. We are seeing schools and markets being targeted. And who are in these communities? Of course, it's women, it's older people, it's children. And we also know that military, military, militarist extremist groups have infiltrated throughout the country. They're just, they're not just in the border regions as we like to think of them. They're throughout all the major cities. So the conversation cannot continue to be just state security, mm -hmm. just border, just like you know, protecting our borders. It's not just about external threats. The threats are very internal. So the conversation has to be about human security. What is human security? How do we all experience insecurity in the streets, in our homes? How do we better understand that? And there's no way of actually coming to that sort of an understanding without including all members of society and communities especially women. So without this understanding, our policies will be empty and they just won't be effective. And then also along with that framing, we also know that women are themselves are playing a very diverse role in this regard, in the, the landscape of Pakistan's peace and security situation. They're victims, we know that. They're being bombed, they're being attacked. Um, they're experiencing insecurity as women because of the extremism. We also know they're drivers of violence. You know, the, the, the incident of the Lal Masjid in Pakistan, women were very integral. And that's important to understand as well. It may be a little overstated at, at times in the media, but it's, it's important. And that is also another reason that women need to be at the table. Can you tell us, give us, the, give us a little, uh, the detail about that particular event? Right. It, well, it was in 2007, and Lal Masjid was really um, a hotbed of extremism, and there was a siege by the government. And women, there was a mothers that attached to the Lal Masjid that was really run by women. And women were taking up arms, and they were fighting the government. They were picking up arms, and they were... So we, we see women in various roles. They're recruiting behind the scenes. They're online, which is a safe space for a lot of women, right? They may not be out in the streets. They're fundraising. We saw that in FATA, where women were selling jewelry for this extremist leader. They, they, they changed their tone later on when they realized what was happening, but women were instrumental. A lot of terrorist leaders are targeting women. They know how to speak to them, especially through social media. And then in Lal Masjid, there was actually picking up arms, an actual part of actual conflict. So that exists, and it's very important to realize that. But there are also preventers, right? And that's really important. And that's, you know, I think that, you know, your question really goes to that. So women, we understand, have unique spaces in communities where the conflict is happening. 
they have knowledge that oftentimes men don't have access to. And they have influence that's both negative and positive. So we see women radicalizing sons and shaming them into war, or we see them de-radicalizing their sons and their men. And there's a lot of anecdotal stories and research that's done on this issue. But you know, women such as Musa Qadim doing vastly important work. I mean, there are the, the important thing to understand is that we're, there are women police, there are women parliamentarians, there are, are women in civil society who are doing important work. They're working in education. There's a lot of women working to reform curriculum, to take out um, material that incites violence and hatred, to replace, not just have Muslim heroes, but to have heroes of other faiths in curriculum. There are women who are working with religious leaders to talk about positive framing of religion in order to combat violence. There are women who are working with youth. There's a lot of women, in, especially in the major cities, working with youth on peace circles and peace clubs. They're training them on conflict resolution and mediation. How do you resolve conflicts in your community that, and not have that those escalate into violence? And there are women such as Wazir Qadim who are working with women, with mothers, to de-radicalize their communities and to integrate, reintegrate men who now or youth, men and women, in fact, who want to continue being part of um, the community. So those, those are some of the kind of the work that women are doing at the community level. So, and you mentioned parliamentarians uh, mm -hmm. that you're working with par parliamentarians in Pakistan. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so much of this this work we're, we're talking about very micro level, community level work. It's in this larger context of um, an ongoing war. And sure. so, you know, what can women do, um, and I, I would say in the U.S. context as well, what can women do to really challenge the, the policymakers at the mm -hmm. highest level to say, wait a minute, what is, what's going on here? What, what is our vision? Is this, you know, it's sort of like when we opened that Pandora's box and decided to approach this threat uh, with military uh, force, it seems that you know the dogs of war were unleashed, right? Right, right. And so Absolutely. we are all sort of facing the consequences now throughout the world, not just in the Middle East, but here, of this being militarized as a mm -hmm. I just would like to get both of your opinions before we, we turn more to some of this smaller, this or micro frame, um, is what can women do in each of our spaces to ask this overarching question, are we using, are, are we creating a vision for our young people that will be attractive, that will be more attractive um, than what they're getting from social media, from, you know, young people, they're, in, they're interested in adventure, they're, they want to be part of something bigger than themselves, right? So, um, young people, we know this. We went through that in our youth. You, you know, you're, you want to be on an adventure. And it seems that this kind of idea of fighting the good, righteous war is very appealing to young people. Mm -hmm. uh, now, we know from some of the reports of some of the people who are, I, I, you know, I can't help it. Whenever there's an article about a young person who was radicalized, I want to know their backstory. What happened? Yeah. Well, you know, how did their mother treat them? How did their father treat them? What's this, what are the psychological dimensions? But every time there's something that they went through where they wanted to be part of something bigger than themselves. So I'm asking each of you, just I'm asking you to, to completely speculate because none of us are, can be experts on this. What if, what can women do in Pakistan, in the United States, to set a, a, a farther horizon mm. to say, let's create a different idea of how we're going to all get out of this. Is anything like that happening? Interest, is anything of interest like that happening where I, I'm particularly interested in women because it is usually women. Yes, women participate in the fighting. We know that um, in every situation, every scenario, including here in the U.S. Um, but women also tend to be thinking longer term. Mm -hmm. Where are we headed with this? It seems to be this sort of cycle of violence. Um, let me ask you each to spec. I'm gonna start with Rabia. I'm gonna each ask you to each just sort of speculate on this from your experience. Um, what you think about that idea? Well, you know, I mean, Karen, just your question and all of the different things that you kind of wrapped up in it. There's so much to unpack in that alone. Um, you know, I, I I have been part of a lot of different forums now that are focusing on the role of women in not just countering violent extremism, but preventing violent extremism. And one thing that um, is a source of frustration to me, uh, which is directly related even to CVE programming, whether it's um, 
how the U.S. government's looking at it, you know, with this new legislation, whether it's, you know, just recently um, David Cameron in the U.K. gave um, an entirely, you know, has created a new policy, gave a new speech about, you know, how they're going to be preventing violent extremism over there, is, is actually a failure to even articulate the foreign policy impacts of, of Western governments, okay? So mm -hmm. what we have now is, what, what we're doing is this, what we're doing is we're saying women, to women, whether they're in Syria, Iraq, Pakistan, Afghanistan, we want you, in your unique roles, to combat issues that have really been exacerbated because of policies that have been created, by the way, by men, mostly. So I would say that the, the greatest impact that women could have on these issues really is on the policy making end. We need in the we need in the Western policy making circles, we need in Washington DC, we need in London, we need here to have women who part of the policy making decisions. And I think the outcomes would be different. I don't think we would have wars on terror if we had women at least, you know, in an equal measure, be having their voices and, and, and representation on these issues. Um, and so you have policies that are largely created by men that are, you know, have very violent outcomes, and then you're asking local women to try to figure out, and, you know, do it. so it's a, it's a very, it's a real uphill battle for them. So I feel like we have to start here, and we have to, again, and, and this, is a, this is an absolute um, grievance that Muslim communities have, is the failure to, for the, for the governments to, it, it, to even even acknowledge the role of the U.S. government, the role mm -hmm. of our war on terror, on the issue of violent extremism. So we keep treating it like it's it's in a vacuum, right? Like I don't know why these young people all of a sudden want to like pick up arms and go to Syria. I mean, like, I, or I don't know what's happening. Like, it, it, obviously there was a sequence of events, and we have all been very cognizant of it. And many of us felt like this is where it's going to go. So I would say, you know, th that's how I feel about. Uh, in terms of the role of women, I think also that but, uh, you identified one of the issues very well, which is the uh, issue of um, what young people are attracted to. And I, what I find fascinating with recruitments, but specifically by ISIS, is you know people debate a lot about whether ISIS is Islamic or not Islamic. And ISIS themselves, they don't, they barely talk about it. Their recruitment on social media is all about image. It's about identity. It's about um, you know, this is a new Muslim identity that we are offering you. We are offering a, 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 the emasculated Muslim male in the in the West can be, um, you know, empowered here in this new in this new state, um, and that you know we are having fun. There's a brotherhood. We have Nutella and kittens and M and M's <laughs> and guns. They they're not they're not giving lectures on scripture, right? They're 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 like we're just a bunch of young, strong, successful. We're successful. We can fight back. We finally have power. We finally have power. So it's a very different, um, you know, approach they're taking than, for example, Al Qaeda took. Um, and we have to think about that. We have to be cognizant of that. Now, I think in the West, when you're talking about recruitment here, so there's two different things. You have recruitment from the West, and you have young people who, for some reason, feel very sympathetic, you know, to, they, they might have no ties to Syria or Iraq or Afghanistan, but they feel very sympathetic to what's happening to the people there, they want to join, um, and the messaging that gets them there is a lot about these identity issues, I would say. And, and some of that is also related to anti-Muslim sentiment in our own countries, okay? But the second thing is for the kind of people that Irfana is working with, right, people who are local on the ground, um, it's not about identity, it's about reality. Their reality is war. Their reality is drones. They are in a war. They have been put in a war, and so for them, it's fight or die. It's fight or die. Um, and so, you know, when people say, when government folks say, you know, we need to counter, we need to counter message the violent extremists, my answer is there is no counter messaging to a drone strike. There's just nothing. Okay, that's their reality. Their reality is war. So, um, but I, I think in the West we have to be a little more, I wish we could get the media on our side and helping to have more positive stories about Muslims. And I think what's one, one interesting thing about the serial and undisclosed phenomena has been for me, as somebody who's worked for a long time in grassroots communities and trying to combat anti-Muslim bigotry, is that even though we're talking about a very devout Muslim family, in the middle of it is this young man who in prison became very devout, but he was convicted based on the theory that as a Muslim male he committed an honor killing 
Um, but that overwhelmingly, um, the public has been on his side, and they have seen the bigotry, and they have denounced it, and they reject it. Uh, and in, in a weird way, it's been one of the most positive storytelling experiences of the American Muslim experience um, without having to talk about religion at all. So, wow, I, that's yeah. really fascinating. Yeah, but I think anti-Muslim bigotry and media portrayals are very important. And mm -hmm. you know, when we use terms, and even when the three of us are talking, we're using terms like radicalization and terrorism. These terms are always connected to Muslim perps in the media. They are never connected. They are never connected to white perps, okay, to white males. It doesn't happen. And so when a Muslim does it, it's a very different. We look at, the, we want the pathology. We want to know what's going on, what's happening in the community, what's in his scripture. Um, when a white guy does it, a white angry male does it, it's a very different analysis and the terminology is different and that the terminology makes a big difference. Uh, okay, so I would like to, to bring Irfana because this is a perfect segue. You mentioned drones. I, you know, talk, what's going on with the women that you work with, hmm. Irfana? Um, you know, the, we, we do have this reality of war. Rabia said that they are living hmm. war. This is no, there's no counter, that, that was just a great statement. There is no counter messaging to a drone strike that kills your family. You can't counter message your way out of that. So Sorry. what is the, how do the women you work with deal with this issue? What is the, I, I know that there are very diverse opinions in Pakistan about of drones, course. but uh, with the women that you work with, how do they view it? And what do they say to American officials when they yeah. interact with them? about it. Sure, no, I mean I think it's a, a, a it's it's such a reality which we can't um, really ignore. So, you know, in conversation with partners and during our workshops, we talk about the reasons for radicalization, the drivers of violence, and you know, we spend a lot of time on internal factors, the legitimate grievances they have against their own state, for example. But of course, there is time spent on external influences. And it's not just US, but it's regional, it's global. There are a lot of forces that are perceived to be working against Pakistani interest and that's always there and the broader policy issues and actions are always identified as a reason for anger and driving extremism. However, at the same time, I mean it's complicated, right, because it's, there is a relationship between the U.S. and Pakistan and that does infiltrate all the way down to civil society. Um, there's funding that exists in the country that's coming from the U.S. and there is a strong desire to, for that con for that funding to be continued, for it to maybe be spent better, but for that funding to be continued. So that that that's absolutely there. So the, so let me you know for example the way that women would talk about this. We had a delegation um, last year where we brought uh, women leaders in Pakistan to meet with policymakers across the board, so they could talk about how U.S. policies are being impacted across Pakistan and how they can be better implemented. And one of the things that we do is we help women to develop concrete policy recommendations. That's really hard. I think most people when they talk about policy recommendations, they're just talking. They're not, they're not actually coming up with concrete recommendations. So we, we work with the women, with our partners, to come up with concrete recommendations. But we also talk about strategy. Like how do you who do you speak with and what are you saying and what are you going to get out of that conversation? So if you're going to meet with somebody at State Department, Counterterrorism Bureau, you can talk about drones, but you may not get very far because they may not actually be able to do anything about it. So you have this opportunity as a policymaker. You could probably get them to fund programs and recruit police women. That's under their umbrella. You could get, you could have an influence in talking to the public diplomacy office about doing um, media campaigns to enhance the role of women in the police or in communities. These things will result in, 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 in decreasing violence, in decreasing um, terrorism. Now, in their comments, they don't shy away. They always, um, they, they do express the fact that, on the one hand, the U.S. is giving funding and to create these programming, and by the other, other hand, then you know there is this, you know, drone warfare. Um, but what we do is we try to direct that. That 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 anger exists, but the reality of the situation is that this partnership also exists. Funding also exists. So we. How do you work within that context? Mm -hmm. and, who do you, and I think this is, this is a message for just about everyone. I think most policymakers are very frustrated when they meet with 
anyone because they don't have any realistic recommendations. So I really think that the women that we work with, the policymakers, we want them get to get in, you know to, to really be effective. So I think that you know I hope that answers your question. But, so let me, um, let me just start because I want to get to the nuts and bolts of of you gave me. Uh, I'd love for you to tell some stories about. Um, how the U.S. how U.S. aid and, and programs can mm -hmm. be more effective. But before we do that, I just want to round out this discussion. Um, I, I think uh, just a question: Do you think that Pakistani civil society and I've had conversations with other friends of mine in Pakistan um, can uh, will at some point create a coherent, strong vision? Um, and what because I, I I hear Rabia's. Um, you know, I hear Rabia's call to us, American women, to create a, a coherent vision, <laughs> an alternative to the war frame. Is there a possibility for that to happen also in Pakistan? What if, I'm just dreaming here, so we, we can dream. Um, what if there were a, a more, um, let's say, bilateral, coherent vision that American and Pakistani women together uh, could advance a different vision, an alternative vision for what to do about the relationship. About so so we can talk. We're going to talk in a minute about the relationship, about the kind of funding, the kind of programs that can work. But on these meta issues, you know, these larger issues, are we in a never-ending cycle of uh, military approaches, or is there a way to step down from this to this violence-based? Uh, approached approach it seems that it just keeps going in cycles so that's just again I'm asking you to speculate here um, and and think could we create some sort of larger dialogues because I know when you go to the State Department you've got friends I, I remember there was a group from Yemen and it was before the Yemeni revolution and they were just sort of lay, laying into the State Department, our friends at the State Department who are great human rights people, and they were just talking about Yemen, about what was happening there, et cetera, et cetera. and the, the, my friends in the State Department were like, oh, they just, they don't know how to talk to us, they don't know how to bring us concrete things. Well, look what happened in Yemen, and this, these groups were right on target. They were exactly what they were warning the State Department about came to pass. So I, you know, I'm just wondering how we can have a coherent dialogue on these larger issues that is is not it doesn't leave us all rolling our eyes like well there's nothing we can do about it so we might as well not even try could we create a coherent dialogue among women peacemakers in the US and Pakistan as an example that could influence our policymakers in Washington and in Islamabad just just again speculating yeah <laughs> No, absolutely, and I mean, I, I think Rabia um, mentioned that the fact that I mean, the, the I think when we we have a double sort of uh, goal here. So, for example, if the goal is to advance women's inclusion in policy making, the goal is to advocate both at the U.S. and at the Pakistan level. And you know, and, and, and another thing, another nuance here is that you know, women on both sides have to work with their own governments, but they also have to educate the other governments. So, for example. There's U.S. funding, and like you said, there are people in State Department and U.S. government who want to spend the, the funds in a certain way because they know it would be more effective. Because some of them are listening to policy to, to women in civil society, for example. But the relationship, the larger relationship, the larger context of the U.S. Pakistan relationship is complicated, and oftentimes the Pakistan government wants the funding to be spent in a certain way. So there are restraints, and this is where I think women, with their you know the legitimacy that they have in their communities, and their their ability oftentimes to reach across borders, can look at come up with concrete recommendations and a vision of shifting policy at the highest levels in both countries where these processes are now inclusive. It's not just about women's rights or human rights. It's really about smart policy. So how do we? What is our? What are our visions? Like how do we? What, what are the recommendations in law enforcement, in civil society, in women in government? Like, for example, three, three, these three sectors. And how have women in other contexts really made a shift? So there's been shifts in Ireland and in Ireland, in South Africa. I mean, those conflicts really shifted when civil society and women became involved. But, you know, the box on the U.S. has a relationship. There's, there's higher level strategic dialogues. That are that exists. So, how can women recommend shifts in each of these sectors and work with their own governments? So, I, you know, absolutely, I think that's that that is one way forward. Okay, so I'm inviting you to invite your partners, and, and we'll do our part um, to 
to think about this more together. I think right. you have to, you know, at, at our Human Rights Defenders Forum last February, you know, we had this idea that we have to do two things simultaneously, more than two things, but these are the these are two large things. One is the, you know, you can look at it like deck chairs on the Titanic, <laughs> in a way, because when there's this horrific thing in the background, it's like all this little. You get, it could look, it could feel like very little, small work that is just, post, you know, it's, it's just because we want to be busy, we want to feel like we're making progress, but it's not. Mm -hmm. We know that's not true. We know it improves things, but it can feel like that sometimes. So in order for us not to be feeling like we're doing, we're rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic, we've got to do two things. One is the programming that, that and I'm going to ask you next to talk about mm -hmm. how programming can improve the pro the, the individual work with women with families etc that's one thing we must do it because people are suffering and so we've got to be in there in the trenches but shouldn't we also this is where my invitation is coming in um, shouldn't we also have this this objective for ourselves to set a vision for the future and to say we are going to think long term we're not going to get stuck and let ourselves just be preoccupied with this, with these programs that are important, but are just going to get demolished the next time mm -hmm. there is a conflict. So can we think, uh, walk and chew gum, gum at the same time, both do these programs, but also keep an eye on the horizon and say, we need a different future. We're going to do our part. You do your part. We've got to talk to our government. This is something that's that I'm very conscious of as an American that my my good friend Hina Jalani, who's a uh, very well known in Pakistan, famous human rights lawyer in Pakistan, when we were talking about this recently, you know, I said I'm very frustrated because my own government, you know, is not really engaged in these big, uh, you know, sort of assessments mm -hmm. and reflections. And she said, Karen, I can't do that for you. <laughs> you have you're the one. You can't ask expect me yeah. to go into a meeting with your state secretary of state. I'll say it, but you know, it's it's this is your your country. It's your policy. So I so anyway, I these are the two things we've got to do some this is what we are we are interested in the Carter Center is is casting that longer time term vision, creating a dialogue around peace. Women peacemakers have a role. So now let's turn uh Irfana to give us an example of when you're when the women peacemakers that you bring mm -hmm. uh, to the United States or that you work with in Pakistan, what are the kinds of improvements that can be made? Because you, as you said, sure. we have this relationship. This relationship is is whether we like it or not, it's symbiotic between the U.S. and Pakistan. It's going to continue. So how can these U.S. funded, taxpayer dollar funded programs? actually help and not make things worse. Give us some examples. Sure. No, absolutely. So, you know, just, just to preface this, so all of the, the, the content of our policies, we, we work with local partners, so we have very strong partnerships. What we're doing, our methodologies, we're providing a framework where we um, allow them to talk about the importance of women, but then we give them examples of how to develop recommendations. So the content of all the work that we're doing is really from women leaders. They are the leaders, they are the experts in their subject matter. So on U.S. funding, so we know that Pakistan since 2002 at least is a leading recipient of U.S. aid. And the messaging from the women has always been it's not about more aid, but it's about spending the money smarter so that it's being utilized and that it actually leads to like a reduction in extremism. So for example, one major area that's been highlighted and there's real in policy interest both in the U.S. and internationally is the fact that the Pakistan, government Pakistan and international donors really need to improve the operational effectiveness of the police. Right, it's this. This war on terror is in communities, and the military isn't and shouldn't be present in communities. The police should. So the police needs to be, you know, it needs to be enhanced. It needs to be capacitated, and we also know that the police women are very important to the operational effectiveness because women police build community, build trust with communities. Their presence de-escalates violence. They are very good at collecting vital intelligence and. You know, they're, they're first responders to attacks, and there's these, these really heart-wrenching stories of when the bombs go off. Um, there are only male police officers that come to respond, and the women are lying there. Their clothes are burnt off. They're naked, and they're dying. Of, of, in, they're in extreme pain, but nobody will touch them because it, there's a social taboo. And it's something as simple as that, and as, as intelligent as women can 
enter homes. They can do searches. They and they're doing that. Anecdotally, they're doing that. They know when there's extra bread being um, delivered to a certain home, and they're like, "Well, why is that happening? Why does this have family have like three times the bread that they normally because bread is delivered to homes in in, in, in in rural areas?" And then they investigate. They go in. They make up stories. They figure out like you know they're they're just they're just talking. They're just figuring things out. Men are not often doing that. So we're making so the, so the women are making the case that the police is important. It's not the military necessarily, and there's a growing acceptance of that fact. But why? How do you operationalize the police force? And the, the the women need to be recruited, retained, and professionalized. So in this regard, the U.S. is spending a lot of money on law enforcement. But what are they doing? They're building. They're, they're, it's mainly equipment and infrastructure, and that equipment and infrastructure is not being. Uh, it's, it's not benefiting women. It's actually a waste of money oftentimes, and that's really not the best use of their funds. One of the things that, that, that a lot of U.S. funding and international funding has done is create women-only police stations. Now, we looked into that, and the women will tell us that that's just not a very good use of funding. Those police stations are not effective. They're not hearing, they're not you know, cutting FIRs, they're not actually doing police work. So it's a waste of money and it's it's just an obstacle. So the recommendation that they came up with and they, they communicate both to their own government and to international donors is, you know, there are high level dialogue that are taking place between the US and Pakistan. Parts of that dialogue are committed to countering terrorism and law enforcement. So our job as, as women in the US, our policymakers in the US is to say, well, when you talk about counterterrorism and law enforcement, can you please talk about the recruitment, retention, and professionalization of police women? Oftentimes the response we get is like, oh, that that's great. And you know, the secretary is very interested in women. However, we're more since the strategic security of the country is more important. So our job is to make that intellectual connection between women's inclusion as a policy issue. And the security of the region and both of the country and the region. That is, that's our work, is to making that connection. This is not just, I mean, women are 50% of the population, and that's very important. I think all of us can agree that this is a human rights issue as well, but it's, it really is only very, it really is only effective, and only, we only see shifts when you make larger arguments. Fortunately or unfortunately, so you know, so the, so that that's our advocacy work. The other things that they're recommending is that you know, again, INL, uh, International Narcotic and Law Enforcement at State Department can use that those funds to um, target to, to develop targeted recruitment to uh, to do drives at university levels to encourage women to be applying to be part of the police force. So that's just one example. We, we, we have recommendations around how women in civil society should be represented in security set, setting mechanisms. And there's ways that we could be advocating to our policymakers, and there are ways that women in Pakistan need, need to be advocating to their policymakers. But policing, I just want to talk about as an example, is because it's very, you know, it's very meaty, and it gives you a good idea of like this is what women know from the ground. They know how police women can be effective. So these are some of the recommendations that we've been working with. Irfana, do you? It just occurred to me. We were when we were in Washington in February. We spoke about the Women, Peace, and Security Act um, that was proposed as part of the U.S. Uh, response to UN Security Council Resolution 1325, which calls for inclusion of women mm -hmm. in preventing, resolving, and recovering from conflict. So there's the Women, Peace, and Security Act. We started, we sort of pulled that out and started looking at it um, again um, as a potential action item that people here could take. If we, if our Congress would pass the Women, Peace, and Security Act, it would, it would direct more resources for women peacemakers. Um, so is this one action that we can help people get involved in that could provide more than um, maybe what what can be provided for under normal grant making uh, mechanisms like under INL or, or Human Rights Bureau at the State Department or others? Is, is that something we should look into? I, I mean I think that's a very intelligent avenue but one of the issues is that so Pakistan doesn't recognize as an actual conflict. So I think now there's there's been a shift since Peshawar's attack on the schools. But you know I think that it's really tricky in Pakistan. The, the reason I work in Pakistan is also 
a little more tricky than our other conflict areas like Afghanistan and Syria is that we don't have a process because there's no real recognition of a war. Right? There is, a, is, is Pakistan at war and who is, at, at, who is it at war with? There's just no recognition. I mean, we, Pakistan is ranked number three on the global terrorist index still. And right after, I think, Iraq and Afghanistan. So there's conflict. There is a war. But there's no real recognition of it. And because of that, 1325 doesn't, doesn't come into play. Um, that's something that, you know, as I, I think especially since the Peshawar attacks, there's, there is more of a recognition. So I think that, you know, going into the future, that could be more of a, you know, more of a strategy. But 1325 doesn't actually apply in that's this context. That's interesting. That's so, so we talk about frames, frameworks, mm -hmm. um, you know, because we, on the one hand, we want um, to get away from the idea of armed conflict. Sure. Uh, uh, because it, it creates this conundrum for us, which is that if we're militarizing a problem, then we're creating new problems as we go along. So in a way, there could be um, other, obviously other vehicles, and INL, which is a law enforcement bureau, the Law Enforcement Bureau of the State Department is um, uh, certainly um, a potential for support for these programs. Um, very good. So, you know, I guess what I would like to, to ask now to both of you, we're coming to the end of our time, is if we can, if, I really want to give the audience some idea of, of, of what can be done. Rabia, first to you, I know that there's legislation coming out on CVE that you mentioned earlier, there's great concern that if we institutionalize and fund a, a domestic CVE series of programs that you could be looking at, and you mentioned, you mentioned the anti-Muslim bias um, aspect of the, of the Adnan Syed case. Um, so talk about that a little bit. What could be, what, what could be the problems uh, associated with cre over programming, you know, you're over-interpreting, you're over-programming something where the, the solutions lie somewhere else. Do you have that concern? Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, I, ha I mean, th this legislation in particular is uh, highly troubling to me, and, I, and I'm one of the rare Muslim activists and advocates who believes that the Muslim community should take a part in CVE somehow. We should have some response to the fact that people are preying on our children, that our own mosques and institutions are at risk. Um, how do we respond to that? How do we independently create responses to that that are not um, a, a direct response to a, a government call even, let's say, right? So we, we I, so uh, having said that, um, you know, what this legislation is doing, I mean, parts of this legislation is, is saying that, you know, we're going to establish this this office, we're going to establish this uh, position, which is going to do things like it's going to do. It's going to identify communities at risk of radicalization. Okay, I mean that is highly. That's kind of scary to me. That, that what, what does that mean? We know so far the CVE has only been about Muslim communities. Now what you're doing is you're taking it a step further, and you're going to formally somehow, I mean, to identify communities who are at risk means you have to come up with what risk factors, let's say, right? I mean, we're getting into such murky territory that is so counter to the research. We know from the research, we know from terrorism experts that there are no risk factors to radicalization. There is no one profile. There is no uh, conveyor belt, uh, you know, to violent extremism. The, every case is very different. Uh, and every case has to be, I think, handled very locally as a law enforcement, public safety, community safety issue, right? Um, instead of a part of, I mean, even with this Chatt the Chattanooga shooting, right? Mm -hmm. We, if we looked at this like the Charleston shooting, where we talk about this as a domestic issue, right? Versus part of this really international framework, which then makes everybody feel helpless, like they can't do anything about it. But for some reason, you know, the government and the feds and all the power of the state has to be on that community, um, you're not going to get anywhere. So I think, you know, this legislation is going to establish and really um, almost institutionalize uh, the stereotypes, the fear, the fear that Americans have about Muslims in the United States. I mean, we get this all the time, that Muslims are a fifth column in the United States, yeah. that Muslims are a suspicious community in the United States. And so when you have 
an office that's going to be dedicated to identifying communities at risk, how are they going to do that? Um, and, there, and also, you know, another provision which is deeply troubling to me is that they're going to want to empower local law enforcement to take on these roles. Now, it was a disaster when local law enforcement was asked to take on immigration enforcement duties, and it still is a disaster. Uh, so to ask local law enforcement officers who should be, uh, who, who will tell you, by the way, w through surveys, through my own work with local law enforcement, that their number one concerns are things like workplace violence, random shootings, uh, drugs, gangs, mm. things like that, and not jihadi extremism. And you take local patrol officers and say, "Here's a bunch of risk factors, you know, uh, and and t take a look at your local communities." You're asking for a lot of trouble, um, and I feel like we're we're like moving closer and closer to internment camps, almost, you know. Well, um, wait, wait, wait a minute. So you know who who mentioned um, this in an interview recently was. Wesley Clark, former presidential candidate, NATO, former NATO com commander. Did you see this video of him call saying that we should have internment camps? This is a former Democratic nominee, uh, uh, presidential cam uh, candidate. There should be um, internment camps for people who essentially take a side. It's like treason. They they don't love. They they're, they may be American citizens, but they're really committing treason by affiliating or having sympathy with. Um, ISIS or something. This actually was last week. Um, I was pretty pretty shocked by that comment. So so I think your your fears are legitimate, Rabia. Um, I think so. What I'm going to do is when we put, when this um, roundtable will be posted on our website under previous roundtables, we're going to have a blog post where we'll post related content. So I'm going to ask you guys to send if you have an article or a petition or some way that people can keep an eye on this issue, Rabia. Let, we'll post it there and, and let people be involved and be, uh, remain informed. Um, and I'm going to ask Irfana too um, to conclude. We've got just a few more minutes left. Um, if you can give us some ideas about how our viewers could be involved, be supportive of women peacemakers in Pakistan, uh, what would you give them uh, as an action item? I, I think it's. Um, in reaching out to maybe Congress members, or just 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 understanding that women, it's it's not just about their role in the community, right? Like as we said, it's not just about what they're doing. That's really important, but really understanding that it's. I, I think the most important thing also is to understand it from a smart policy angle. Something that I mentioned earlier that we often get talk about women's rights and human rights, and that women's role here is not just securing the security, just not not just securing other women, and it's not just about de combating domestic violence, yeah. but it's really looking at the larger framework. And the thing is, this is what is very. It, this is what shifts policy. I mean, I remember with domestic violence laws. Domestic violence laws came into place not just because people were convinced that it's wrong to violate women, but it was because it was expensive. And that's why Hillary Clinton talked about um, that the cost of domestic violence. And that is what shifted policy. And I think that's really sad in some ways, but that's a reality. And I think we can continue to talk about women's inclusion from a human rights perspective, which is very important, but we also have to understand how policies are shifted. And that is by really having a larger conversation about what our security needs are here in the US as well as abroad, where our policies are affecting women on the ground. And that is why women have to be included. So what can we do to make that a reality? I think it's a great question. You know, we often end up talk, working with grass tops, right? We're working with policy makers and policy shapers, but there is a role for everyone to play to really understand that we're talking about the peace and security of a country, of a region, and of our of, of our of, of the of the you know of, of the globe, and how there is a connection between what's happening in Pakistan and what's happening in communities over here. So I, I completely agree with Rabia in terms of you know we can't we cannot apply the same the same framework. However, they're they're connected. You know, if there are young boys being radicalized in Karachi, that could be happening here as well. Uh, but when we talk about women's inclusion, let's just, let's really make this a mainstream issue. So when we talk to State Department, when you talk to any policymakers, you're not talking from a women's issues perspective. It's a, it's just too dangerous to do that. I just don't think we can continue to afford to do to talk about women's inclusion purely from that perspective. So, so that is what I that, that's sort of like my would be my messaging to people who are involved in this field, who are doing research, who are working in think tanks, 
and who have any level of access is to is just to really focus on that framing. So. Yeah. Okay. So so what we're saying is women, uh, uh, as well as caring about domestic violence and women's rights, we care about security overall. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, obviously, um, but sometimes that isn't obvious. Sometimes people, mm -hmm. when we talk about, you know, the, the the name of this forum is women, religion, violence, and power. That there's a reason for that because we we don't want to sort of silo women over here so that women's issues. Um, but what we recognize is that women are often excluded from those policy conversations. Uh, we are not a, a, a sort of a cohesive and coherent force uh, impacting policy in a different way. Um, and I'm not talking about individual women being president, okay, a particular woman being president. I'm not talking about that because we know that. But I am noted, I, I I did notice, for example, that the team in Vienna in the Iran nuclear talks, there were a significant amount of women, including in the U.S. delegation. And I have to say, I was very happy about that. And, um, you know, here's an example. We have a decision to make as a nation. Are we going to confront Iran militarily, or are we going to use diplomacy, mutual respect, mutual diplomacy, and I, I, for one, am extremely relieved that our government took the, the path of diplomacy in this case. And, it's, and it shouldn't go be lost on us that we could have done the same with Iraq in 2002 and yeah, yeah. 2003. Uh, there was vast support for some kind of police action in Afghanistan after 9-11. But once that was done and once there was, uh, there was no more international support for the actions we took after that. So, we so so this is this is something that we should note. One thing that that our audience can do is support diplomacy. And in the case of the Iran diplomacy, uh, thank goodness um, that we had um, some really really diligent work being done by our team. So I have to say I'm quite proud and happy about that. And so you know perhaps we that that's a, a happy note um, for us to to end on. Um, but we will post. We'll do a blog post. Um, at uh, our website, the Forum on Women, Religion, Violence, and Power. And please, Irfana and Rabia, send us uh, a couple of links, related content that you, you would like our audience to, to have um, access to, so we could post it there, but also a way to stay engaged going into the future. Um, so thank you to Rabia Chaudhry and to Irfana Anwar for joining us today. Um, this podcast will be archived on our website, and we will have future conversations about this as events unfold and as we learn more and more about um, how to counter violent extremism in the U.S. and abroad among um, all communities. Um, thank you thank very you. much for your Thank participation you. today and to our audience for your interest. Thanks, Karen.